grandson finish the race. Okay. See what the end going to be. In other words, he was saying, when you're going through your life's journey, there are going to be some ebbs and flows. And quitters never win. Finish the race Finish and see the what race. the end is going to be. This is a journey. Let me take you on a journey. There will still be the journey. The journey. New Sheriff in town, and the name is the journey. Journey. This thing is bigger than Nino Brown. This is the journey. The journey. What is it that moved you? The journey. The journey. The journey. The journey. The journey. The journey. Welcome back to another edition of the journey. I'm your host, Larry Robinson. And as I always promise you time and time again, that we have somebody that is going to burn the doors off. This is a Memphis icon that you just haven't heard his story in the detail that we're going to bring it. So just hold tight. First, we have our quote, never be limited by other people's imagination. That was said by the great Dr. Mae Jameson, first African-American female astronaut. And I can say beyond a shadow of a doubt, our guest, our Memphis icon, really has some of those same beliefs in his heart because I'm sure he was thought to be limited because of his neighborhood and all those things, but he ascended. He came through like a falcon. We're talking about Elliot Perry, lifelong Memphian, straight out of Treadwell High School, public servant, entrepreneur, former NBA player, art collector, son, husband, father, graduate of University of Memphis as well. So please welcome to the journey, Elliot Perry. What's up, Elliot? What's up? How you How doing? You doing Thanks man? for having me, man. Man, I, I, I feel it. honored yeah. to be well, here likewise, with you. Likewise, likewise. <laughs> so we're gonna start right in on the on the quick fire questions. Community you were brought up in, and, and tell us a little bit about it. I grew up in North Memphis, um, right North off of North. County, yeah, right off of kind of Jackson and Meager, Jackson, Hollywood, in that area, sort okay. of, and. Um, I, you know, I have really fond memories of my, my neighborhood. Uh, obviously, it was a really close-knit neighborhood, uh -huh. um, you know, where f people sat out on the porch, your mom okay. and your grandmom, your grandfather them sat out on the porch. And, Did you, you have know, a lot of played, family members that lived in had like family the members, coast? Had family members there. But, I mean, I, when I think about family in the neighborhood, I think more about the neighborhood collectively. Okay. You okay. know, you play pick-up and run football, you're right. playing basketball in the street. Okay. Um, you know, you're playing baseball. I mean, just right. all of those things that you do right. as a young person. But, you know, some of my fondest memories are Hold on, people. Don't go there. No, don't no, go no. There I just want to say okay, that, okay, that people okay. took care of people. Okay. You know, like those, okay. those things, I think, are lost sometimes in our neighborhoods because we, 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 we don't have those collective neighborhoods anymore. You know, right. everybody's kind of separated a little bit. We don't mm -hmm. look out for each other as much anymore. Right. Uh, you know, I knew Miss Louise, if I was doing something right. bad, that right. she would hold me accountable. Right. Same thing with my grandmother. If she saw my good friend Kevin doing something bad, she would hold him accountable. Right. And you had that, that sort of, that, that kind of respect. And so, again, I mean, North Memphis really raised me. Okay, all right, a man of the village, yeah. all right. Who, who outside of your parents had the biggest impact on Elliot Perry? Easy answer. I mean, I, there, there were many people who had a significant impact on my life, mm -hmm. Larry. I think the most impactful person was my mentor, Michael Tony. Really? And the reason I say that is, um, um, I, Michael Tony lived up the street from me. He was, okay. uh, he was a freshman at, at Memphis State at the time. Okay. And um, I always knew him, but I never really just had a lot of conversation with him. And one day we, I was up there messing, kind of messing with his dad, and. Mm -hmm. um, he sat me down on the, his little steps in front of his house and he started asking me these questions like, okay. how are your grades? Right. Uh, where, where, you, where are you going to college? You know, okay. Have you thought about college? Okay. And I, again, I'm in the sixth grade. So okay, I'm well, not, hold I'm on, not, hold on. We're going to get to all of that. I'm not thinking about all those things, but he was the biggest influence on my life because okay. over time he developed into my mentor. Okay. I don't think we were calling it, it that at the time. I think right. he just saw a young person that he wanted to pour into. Right. And and just did it and really paid, paid it forward. And so I'm really grateful for him because he really challenged me in a lot of different ways and helped really shape my thinking. All right, shout out to Michael Tony. Uh, what decision did you make as a younger person that ended up having lifelong ramifications, but at the time you didn't happen to know that it would? I'll go back to my mentor again. Okay, okay. Um, this is the greatest lesson that I've learned, mm -hmm. one of, 
okay. uh, in my life is, um, and he always used to tell me, you know, before you can, you know, be accomplish anything, mm -hmm. first you had to go through the process of right. anything. Like you can't skip these steps. If you if you're trying to skip these steps, you're trying to take shortcuts. It's going to catch up with you. Mm -hmm. Anyway, long story short, yeah, I just man just questioning myself and said I couldn't do something. Every time I said I couldn't do something, he would always say, why do you think you can't do something? Okay, let's go try to do it. And wow. trying to show me that I could accomplish these things. Right. Anyway, one day I was just struggling and he took me to a mirror mm -hmm. and he put me in front of the mirror. He said, you see that little boy looking back at you? Everything you need to know in life, he's gonna tell you. He's gonna be the first to tell you. He's gonna be the first person to tell you when to quit. He's gonna be the first person to tell you when to keep going. He's gonna be the first person to tell you, hey, let's push through. If you can conquer him, then you'll be successful. Oh, that's And powerful. that little boy looking back at you, I always say, even to my own daughter is, if you can conquer your own fears, mm -hmm. and you can conquer your own self-doubt, right. then there's nothing nobody else can do to you. And so that's the greatest lesson that I've ever learned. Fantastic. How different are you from the person you dreamed you would be as a child? I think, um, I, you know, this is, that's, that's a unique question because um, nobody in my family graduated from college at the time or right. went to college at the time. And so, you know, most people graduated out of high school, got jobs or whatever. Right. And so I was the first person in my family to, to go to college. Obviously, uh, you know, basketball has something to do with that. Right. Um, and, you know, just being open to constructive criticism and kind of all of those things, mm -hmm. um, I think helped kind of shape my life. Did you dream um, you would be a ball player as a young guy? I think, you know, by the time I got into, you know, somewhere in that 11th, 12th grade, you know, mm -hmm. started getting better and better, you know, was a McDonald All-American. And then, you know, going to college, you always dream about when you're watching the NBA, right. you know, watching Dr. J and watching right. Magic Johnson and Mo Cheeks and all of those guys that, um, that's a place you wanted to land. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, through, just through the grace of God, I think some of those things happened for me and the fact that mm -hmm. I never let self-doubt creep in. Okay. And, and what I mean by that is I've never had a quit attitude. Mm -hmm. You know, I've always been able to push through. I've always been able to, you know, stabilize myself in the valley and right. knowing that, you know, eventually I'll come out of that. And so I think that's, you know, for me, when I look back, mm -hmm. and I know this may be a long way around, Larry, but w when I look back, I think of life kind of as, um, as you're putting a puzzle together. Right. When you're putting a big puzzle together, you spend most of your time looking for that one piece that fits perfectly. Right. And, you know, when I look back, I think about all the things that helped shape me, all the things that I didn't go here, but I went here. Right. I made this move, but I didn't make this move. I encountered this person and right. I was open to listening to this person and right. I didn't encounter that person. Mm -hmm. You know, I made some decisions in my neighborhood that was a little bit different from some of the people who I grew up with mm -hmm. that helped me. And obviously, you know, my mentor and my family was, had, has always been a, a support for me. And so, right. um, you know, again, it's vastly different from mm -hmm. what I thought it would be when I was in the sixth, seventh, eighth grade. Mm -hmm. um, but I think once I started to get into the 10, 11, 12th grade, I knew that I could be successful because I had developed a lot of these things that Michael Tony instilled in me. Last question for this segment, and I always ask this of, of especially the brothers. Um, when did you realize that you were a black man? Hold on, hold on, before you answer that, before you answer that. Listen, we're gonna be right back on the journey, and Elliot Perry is gonna share with you when he realized he was a brother. So listen, don't go anywhere, stay right there. Larry Robinson, this is a journey. We'll be back after this. Kudzukian. based in Memphis, but it is international. A new building, an expanded team, new equipment, a new studio, all inside of seven years. 
the resources that we were able to utilize with Kazookian and their team has been incredible. And our partners at Kazookian has been a large part of our success. One, it's black owned. So we get to tell our own stories in our own way. I'm so proud of the founder, Larry Robinson, and his entire family and all of the team here at Kazookian. We are so proud of their progress that they've made here in Memphis. The social media and the technology we have today the world is listening. Kazookian. Check out all your Kazookian favorites now. Download the Kazookian app, available on Android and iOS. Welcome back to The Journey. I'm your host, Larry Robinson. And as you recall, before we went to the break, Brother Elliot Perry was sharing with us when he first realized he was a black man, a brother. Uh, again, that's, that's, a, that's another good question, and, and, and I'll answer it like this, is I've always known that I was a brother, you okay. know? And the reason I say that is because there were so many, you know, growing up I had all, basically all black teachers. Okay. And they, instilled in me, imported in me, the importance of mm -hmm. excellence, right. the importance of accountability, right. you know, trying to shape me to think about when I do leave these walls and become an adult, you know, I can never get rid of this. And so, um, and then move on to middle and high school where you have your coaches, you have teachers there who really poured into me. Uh, my high school coach, Garmin Curry, I mean, talking about shaping somebody is holding mm -hmm. somebody accountable. Um, and, and then going on to college and Coach Finch was, you know, just the icing on the cake for me, you know, honestly. And because I knew that, um, I, I look back at what my grandfather and him had to go through. Right. And uh, some of his experiences that he shared with me mm -hmm. and realized that they lived in a different world than I lived in. And so, you know, for me, I've always known that I was a black person and tried to hold up that sort of excellence and, and in a way that, you know, not the I'm beating on my chest mm -hmm. part of it, um, because I've always said that um, I'm not an activist, but I'm an advocate, you know, uh, and I think that they, they, they both are important, right. uh, but uh, that's just the way I choose to go by it. And so I've always known that I was a brother, you know, wow. I didn't take police to pull me over or you know, somebody that pushed my head in the ground and tell me, you know, this or that. I just, I've, I've known that because people have poured into me um, and, and to let to me be know. knowledgeable. A exactly. That fact. Got it. Your grandfather um, was a gentleman in the famous picture, the I Am a Man yeah. picture. What did he leave young Elliot? Hi. <sighs> talking about a guy who had sixth grade education. Worked his ass off every day. <sighs> marched in and marched with Dr. King in the 68. Not because he knew that it would have a profound effect on his life, but it could possibly have a profound effect on his grandkids' life. Right. And my grandfather had a, he had a famous, famous saying that he used to say to me. <sighs> Sorry about that. No worries. Take your time. He had a famous saying he used to say to me all the time. And he used to say, Grandson finished the race. Okay. See what the end gonna be. In other words, he was saying, when you're going through your life's journey, there are gonna be some ebbs and flows. And quitters never win. Finish the race Finish and see the what race. the end is gonna be. And it's such a simple statement but as I've grown older, I realized that 
I live by, and this is my thing, I live by the, I live by the, the, you know, 80-10-10 rule. Okay. 80% of the things that we worry about, they never happen. For whatever reason, they just never materialize. 10% of the things we worry about in life and in our life journey, they self-correct. It happens, but something intervenes and self, they self-correct. And then the other 10% is just life. We got to deal with it. And so that's the reason I can hang on to his statement and finish the race because I know that, you know, some of these things never materialize. Some of these things are self-correct. And then the other things, I just got to deal with them. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's what my grandfather meant to me. Going back to North Memphis, what was the family structure like in your household? Yeah, so it's interesting because my mom was 15 when she had me. Oh, wow. So my mom was young when she had me. And so we lived with my grandmother and my grandfather pretty much until I went to college. So we had my s grandmother, grandfather, me, my mom, I had and two other aunts that lived with us. And then when they had a child that was, a, you know, her child that right. was there. And so, you know, obviously we had a house full of people, you know, eight, nine people in a, you know, four bedroom house, but a small four bedroom. Right. And so that that was our family structure, and and then you know my aunt lived around the corner, you know you know yeah, how it is. Yeah, you know, know, you know, it is aunt lived it. around the yeah. corner. Your uncle lived around the corner as right. well. You know they had their families, and 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 um, you know I mean I just I'm so grateful for my family structure because they've n they've always encouraged me, um, and they've never like. Put that doubt in me, and, right. and you know, berated me in a way that I, you know, I couldn't recover. You know, it was always, you know, you could do this, and, and I mean, and, I, and again, I'm just, I'm, I think God shaped a lot of that as well. You, you, you started to smile when you were talking about your uncle living around the corner, your aunt living. Around. What's a fond memory of that time, of that period, young Elliot in the neighborhood, going from house to house? Oh man, eating, <laughs> eating. You know, my, my, look, we, we, my grandmother and or somebody cooked breakfast every Saturday morning. Uh -huh. So, and then they would come over there over our house and, and eat breakfast with us. And so, you know, just that kind of unity. I can, I'm, 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 I'm looking back at when my grandmother, mother may, may bring the um, ice cream maker out, and you know, kids, uh -huh. you take turns turning the ice cream maker, and and and. Just, again, just all of those really simple things in life. There's nothing, you know, we didn't have mm -hmm. a lot of money. We didn't have a big house. We didn't have, you know, fancy cars. We didn't have all of those things. Right. But we had love um, and we had togetherness. And, and, and uh, you know, some of my other fondest memories, and not just in the neighborhood, is, I mean, man, we, we've we been having for, the, I mean, you know, due to COVID, but prior to that, I mean, we've been having family reunions for the last 50, 52, 53 years. And so... Wow family in St. Louis, family in Memphis, either we're going there or they, they're coming here. So okay. that's just, you know, that unity. Cool, cool. Um, during that time, the neighborhood time, you remember worse, because cause see, we always think that the guy, once he made it to this level, the level that you're at, uh, philanthropist, art collector, and all of that, that that's where your life started. And that's not where your life started. Can you give us, because everybody got something that they dealt with, something that happened that was not necessarily a fine memory, that that just life during those early years in North Memphis. Yeah. Um, you know, I think there were some. I don't think there were catastrophic right. memories where something really drastic happened that you know right. altered my life mm -hmm. i think the more things in my community that altered my life was you know going to the community center and knowing that i'm a decent basketball player and i'm mm -hmm. trying to get better and but i'm still playing on the little end because you had two ends the big end and the little end and, right you know i come up there one saturday morning and the director said put your name on the list i said whoa on the big end? <laughs> yeah. on the big list put your name on the list and, you know, w w what I gather out of, out of that, uh, also here's another story is, guys in my neighborhood who 
what for whatever reason, whatever they were doing, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying, didn't didn't matter, you right. know. And they people used to stand on the corner all the time and do whatever and right. just kinda and every time I tried to go up there and stand on the corner, guys would, you know, make me leave. Right. You know, you don't belong here, you got something bigger to do. Right. And I think, you know, again, all of those things help shape me because it's easy to go down the wrong road. You were protected. It's easy, exactly. I, I, think, I think I was protected in a way where I'm not trying to take credit for it. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to give credit to those guys, but more importantly, that, you know, everything that I've accomplished in life has been because of God's hands. Like, right. I, I, can, I, I cannot honestly say that I did this thing and I, 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 I'm, I'm self-made in this way. You okay. know, God directed a lot of my path and took step. me out of situations, mm -hmm. yeah, and ordered my steps in, in some ways. And so, man, I know that's not the answer, but I just no, like, there was nothing the really catastrophic that happened in my, while I was growing up that, you know, tell us shaped about, me in a way. Tell like us that. about you playing ball and being in school at Treadwell. Yeah. When, you know, 11th grade year, you balling out, Ooh. starting to really get yeah. attention. Um, what was that like when, when you started, everybody started knowing, man, it's Elliot Perry. Yeah. I mean, that was, you know, that was <laughs> interesting because, you know, in, the com in, my, in my own community, you know, my nickname was Chuck. Okay. In my community. And so, like, there were guys in my community once I got in 11th grade and, you know, people started knowing, knowing me citywide. Uh-huh. They would say to somebody, hey, have you heard this? This guy, Elliot Perry, I mean, he... They didn't know kid, you was Chuck. <laughs> this kid hooping, he had Trey West. like, no, I didn't know. Yeah, you know the guy at... And somebody would be like, oh, you're talking about Chuck? <laughs> you know, oh, okay, yeah. You know, so, again, you know, that, that, that in my neighborhood, I was a different person in terms of because I was just Chuck and just right. hooping, in, you know, community center Where and still Chuck going to the community. From? Man, I don't know. My uncle gave me that name. And so, I still don't know the backstory <laughs> to that. It just stuck. All and, right. But... Uh, I think once I started to gain some notoriety and, mm -hmm. you know, 11th grade year really hooping tough and 12th grade year um, playing well, you know, I, I tried to, I'm going back to that, mm -hmm. that, that, that little boy in the mirror mm -hmm. is maintain a certain level of humbleness and okay. maintain a certain level of, you know, just being myself. And mm -hmm. the, 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 the one thing I can say, Larry, is... Um, and this is what I tell my daughter all the time, and even young men that I, mm -hmm. I face is, just be yourself. Right. Nobody in this world can beat you being you. Right. And so, no matter if you're high or low, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, you just be yourself. And that's what I've, I tried to maintain, and, and you know, with all of the accolades um, and press. <laughs> Recruiters coming in, just kind of all of those things, man. I, again, I have fond memories. I, was, I, I told somebody once that even though we didn't have a lot of money, for, I don't know how it, it got done, but I had my own phone line in, my, in our house because so many calls from recruiters were coming in that, like, you it was can't tying even, up the phone. Yeah, I was tying up the lines. And, <laughs> it, uh, wasn't, it wasn't call so waiting back then. <laughs> no call waiting, so I have my own line. So I, that, that was big boy at the time. Right, right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. Wow, you had your own line. Um, the period that you, when, when you got to Memphis, what was, you, what was it being, oh no, before that, why did you choose Memphis and what was the school that came in second place? It's a good question. Um, so I had kind of narrowed my thoughts down to, 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 to Memphis, three, really kind of three schools. Okay. I had narrowed my thoughts down to Memphis, North Carolina, and and uh, Roy Williams was recruiting me really hard. We we developed a good relationship. I still got pictures at my house of Dean Smith sitting in our living room in North Memphis, you know, oh, wow. sort of that kind of thing. And then uh, and then Kentucky, you know, took a really good trip up to Kentucky. A guy named Richard Madison, they called him Master Blaster. Master he was Blaster. a senior at the time at Kentucky. Mm -hmm. So again, I just had a good recruiting visit there, and um, and so um, I got a. I, the, the day before I made my decision to go to Memphis, I got a call at, at midnight on my line, and it was Coach Finch. And, um, you know, I think he really kind of got down to more of a personal uh, conversation than, than talking basketball and trying to recruit me. And, um, you know, just talked about, 
you know, what it would mean for me to come there and play in Memphis, being from Memphis, what it would mean to him personally as his first recruiting class and his first recruit, the first McDonald All-American that ever signed at Memphis at the time. Uh, and um, I just remember the last thing he talked about, well, not talked about, the last thing he said was, I need you, little man. And uh, this doesn't have anything to do with basketball. This is, you know, this life. Yeah. And um, I, I think I made my decision that night. I got up that next morning and told my mom. And um, she asked me, was I sure? And I was like, yeah, uh, it's, it's Memphis. And who so, would, if it wasn't Memphis, who would you have gone to? I think it, it may have been North Carolina. You okay. know, I, 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 like I said, I established, established a really good relationship with um, um, Roy w Williams there, and right. I, I like their style of basketball. I love Dean Smith. Obviously, I mean, Jordan was right, there, right. Worthy, Perkins, you know, right. you're looking at all those guys who wow. played there before, so, um, so it may have been North Carolina. Any regrets? Any regrets? No. In terms of what? Just life. This is anything you'd want to want to mulligan? No. I, you know, I think all of those things help shape who I who I am, and and those experiences I I hold dear. Even the ones where I failed, you know, even mm -hmm. the ones where I would cut off NBA teams and had to go down to the CBA and play in the CBA and then get called back up and had to go back down to the CBA, play a whole another year in the How CBA. How many times you think you were cut? Uh, when, how many times do you think from the NBA level that you NBA were told level, that you weren't good enough? Uh, I, you know what? I never, wa I never was told I was not good enough. Okay. I, I, I was cut four times in the NBA before, you know, before ultimately make it, making it. And, and every time, uh, one time I got drafted by the Clippers, I, w I made the roster. I was a second round draft pick, made the roster, played 10 games with them, got waived. Went to the CBA, played two games, got called up by the Charlotte Hornets, uh, played my full rookie season, rest of the rookie season there. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the next year, I ended up getting cut from Portland. Right. Um, made the last cut, but you know things just didn't work out. Right. You know, went to the CBA, spent a full year in the CBA there. Next year, played for Portland in the summer league, tried out for the, their team again. Thought I had made the roster, got a call. One o'clock in the morning. These late night calls. We had a game the next day, so I had got, I mean, I thought I was in. Right. You know, ended up getting cut. Uh, left there. Went to Grand Rapids, Michigan, playing in the CBA there. Played 20 games there. We had a really good team there. And then um, ultimately get called up to the Phoenix Suns. And, That's uh, when you know, the rest, changed. yeah, life changed. The rest was history. And so, uh, I, you know, again, I just think. In those ebbs and flows, I've, 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 I've always been able to stabilize myself and not be, be e I always say be emotional, but not play with emotion, but don't be emotional, gotcha. you know. Gotcha. And, and in those valleys, I've always been able to stabilize myself in the valley, yeah. knowing that, you know, and, and then still all, ultimately trying to stabilize myself in the peaks too, you know, right. I think that um, it never got too high, got too low. And so, um, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't have any, you know, regrets on, you know, on anything. If, if I did have some regrets, it, it would probably center around, I had an opportunity to help somebody and I, you know, I chose not to at that time, mm -hmm. or, um, you know, somebody may have been crying out for help or attention and I just kind of, for whatever reason, mm -hmm. you know, was not paying attention to, their voice or something like that. But I'm gonna go off script a little bit. And yeah. I know we run down on time, yeah. but but what has your wife meant to your life? Yeah, um, having that help me. Yeah, everything. You know, I think you know for for me is um, she t obviously stabilized the family, um, mm -hmm. and and you know where I'm working on this side. You know, trying to probably like any man trying to you know make a living, man, right. think about these things, you know, we got to think right. about the future, you got to think about, and then all of these other things over here that are just as important in terms of the family structure, in terms mm -hmm. of all mm -hmm. the things that hold us together, you know, she, she, she's doing all of those she's things, rock, and so um, she's meant a great deal because of her personality, you know, she's lighthearted. Um, in moments where I struggle, she can, you know, make light of it, and, and the same in moments where she struggles, I can make light of it, and, and then just 
you know, having a daughter and implementing that into the family structure has been, you know, really beneficial for me. Uh, and, and, and I got married late, so right. uh, I think that I was already kind of settled in at the time. Okay. Looking at that young man that Michael Tony was, that showed himself in the mirror and said, that's the guy you got to worry about. If you could go back and talk to that young man, what would you say? What advice would, I would you give him? I would, I would, I would say, I would say three things. You know, I think I go back to what my grandfather said is, is, you know, finish the race. You know, see what the end is going to be. You know, nobody can quit in the middle of a race and win. I don't care what you do. And so, you know, have that non-quit, quit, quitting attitude. Mm -hmm. I would say, uh, what my mentor taught me, and that is, uh, that person looking back at you in the mirror is has all the answers, and that God has given you every ingredient you need, mm -hmm. every ingredient you need to be successful. Whatever success is to you, God has right. given you that, um, as He's given all of us that. And, um, and and you know, and then I and I would think that the last thing is no. You can never run a race on your own. You can never run a relay race on your own. And think of life as a relay race. And there's four legs. Right. And all of those legs are intricate because there are other people pouring into you and handing the baton off to you. And then ultimately you have to hand it off to somebody else. And, and so really trying to think of those four legs as um, I'm going to run the best race that I can run while I have this baton in my hand uh, because I think again about my grandfather and Dr. King and all of those people who were running that relay race who set the table for us to eat off this table that we didn't do anything to um, deserve it. To deserve it. Um, that's, you know, n I feel like I have the baton now and I'm going to try to run the best race that I can run while I have this baton and so because ultimately I'll have to pass it off to a younger person and I hope that they have that those same sentiments. Wow. I don't even need to say anything else. This is The Journey. I'm your host Larry Robinson. Today you got pearls dropped on you by none other than the great Elliot Perry. So Elliot, thank you. Thank Man, you for thank being you. here. Thank you for taking your time to share with these young people, you know, what it's going to take to win and finish that race. Absolutely. All right. Listen, we're going to keep bringing them. Memphis icons. Keep coming back on the journey. I'm Larry Robinson for Elliot Perry. Thank you for watching or listening, whatever you're doing. Take care. Thank you to our partner, the Grand Boulet of Sigma Pi Phi Fraternity Delta Chapter. To hear more incredible stories like this, be sure to download the Kazookian app from the App Store or Google Play or check out the Journey Memphis podcast on all your major podcast providers. Also, check us out on the Kazookian Network.